We are live. Let's go live. Go live. <laughs> Let's get that. Get those sound levels up a little bit. What's going on, guys? Kyle Kelly from the Island Wide Team at EXP, and uh, this is episode two of On the House podcast. Uh, got my good friend here, Anthony Carmadella of the A Team, to loan us his space because uh, I don't know if you saw some of my previous. Uh, footage that I had Sharon on. Sharon, again, thank you for joining me on episode one, but uh, the, the sound was just no good. So we're working on that in my studio, and uh, Anthony had said he's got a studio all set up, and uh, audio is looking good, so hopefully this works out a little better for this one. And uh, yeah, let's let's introduce a uh, good friend of mine, Anthony. We've Cheers. known each other God, going back to uh, Coldwell Banker days now, going yes. on about 12, 13 years. It's been a while. Uh, how long have you been in the business now? So it's going on year number 16 for me. 16? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got in uh, unofficially in like 2014, and then I actually got my license in, 2000, uh, in 2007, sorry. So 2004 Seven. unofficially, and then got my license in 2004. 2004, and then 2007. Yeah. Gotcha. So what's uh, unofficially mean? So how, do, how does that work? I, I, without getting into any DOS issues. Or yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I can't get in trouble for this. It was all legal. Uh, the, the first house I ever sold was my grandmother's house, and I sold it via for sale by owner. Okay. To actually, uh, he was my Best Buy manager at the time. Um, and he is now actually a member of my team. So nice. shout out Jim. Thanks for buying my grandma's house and starting my <laughs> career. Uh, that's awesome. how it got started. So little uh, little for sale by owner was the first thing. And then I was like, hey, this was this was actually kind of interesting. But I was still in college, trying to do the right thing and right. finish college. Uh, and like round four at Suffolk Community. And <laughs> thank God for a teacher who just looked at me and was like, dude. I've, I've been to four colleges. I think I have 32 credits to prove it, and 12 of them are gyms. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, I did really good in the golf class over at Sunday. <laughs> right Volleyball. Uh, Volleyball is it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, uh, but the, the teacher there was great, um, and, and he, uh, he encouraged me. He says, you know, if you have options, what would you do? I was like, I'd sell real estate. And he's like, yeah, you should go and do that. And that was actually in 2007, and I took my real estate license, and I actually never went back to college after nice. that. So nice. Thank yeah. you very much to that teacher. If you're well, I, well, I've had a uh, you know, chat with uh, Melissa Principe, right? And she's got her, her master's and MBA, and uh, so the, does it require that type of education to be in real estate? And yes and no, right? So you don't need it, but it depends on the clientele you're working with, right? And people are going to work with people they know, like, and trust, and I don't necessarily work with a clientele that requires me to have a master's. They require me to know what I'm doing in real estate. Yeah, we. Uh, I think we both learned pretty quickly that this is very much like a people business. Yeah, and fortunately for the two of us, we get along with people. So for the most part, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're good people. Yeah, we get along with good people. Yeah. Um, so, quick, quick little story about uh, my, my first one of my first interactions with AC. Um, I, I saw my first house, which was my my in laws' house, and uh, I, I come back and I'm like, I walk in the back door of of Cobalt Banker and. I go, hey guys, I, I got an accepted offer. And he's like, oh, congratulations. Okay, now what do I do? I like, no clue. Like, what, what do I do? He's like, okay, next will be the home inspection. And after the home inspection, then it'll go to contract. What do you mean contract, you know? And I think that's where we, we kind of are on the same level now of realizing the lack of support that agents get, the lack of training the new agents get. You know, a lot of times you're just thrown out to the wolves, go get a listing, go sell a house, and then you'll learn. And uh, I think we're both in agreement that it just doesn't work well. Right? It's dangerous, Fair right? Way. Like, what if I only taught, like, I taught drivers that for a short period of time in my life, <laughs> as scary as that is. That's why I have... I love, I love to put so together have, a list of, like, all the have jobs great. we've had. Yeah, yeah. Like, Kyle and I cover all of Long Island. Yes, you, yes. you have employed one of us at one point in time. That's a fact watching this show. The, uh, the... If you look at it from that perspective, like what if I just gave the book version and they never did driving and driver's ed? Right. Right? How many people got behind the wheel with a right. license and just started driving, right? It's the same scary circumstance because they've never had field practice. They've never gotten behind the wheel of the car before. Yeah. It's safe to say that while legally the class we take is very necessary, field-wise, it's you not exactly that. tactical. Teach it teaches you real estate law. Teaches you how not to get in trouble, <laughs> what to disclose. Yeah, and, yeah. If you can remember those parts, you know, I mean, be a good person do, covers 90%. Do you remember what riparian rights are? <laughs> you know, and I, I say all the time, I'm like, you know, meets and bounds was a necessary thing to learn. Right. But, you know, I, nine times out of ten, I feel like we don't even get to experience that 
or show that experience because the lawyer is usually the one that'll deal with a title issue or something like that anyway. So for us, we don't even get to show off that we actually know how to deal with that issue. (laughs) The lawyer takes that thunder. But yeah, from a tactical standpoint for new agents, like it's not their fault. Um, and, and the frustrating part is, is that you have people who are making like lifetime arrangements based on the information they're getting from someone who's never done the transaction before. Um, <laughs> you know, they know that they have to bring in best and highest, uh, so they just slap together any kind of thing uh, to get an offer in. Yep. And we, uh, through confusion as listing agents, we try to sort through the best and highest offer. And many a times, uh, because we're handcuffed. By legality, we can't ask as many questions as we might like to in order to ensure maybe a little bit of a safer deal, right. and you end up ending in your transaction with a first-timer who has no. no idea to ask for a commitment letter or even that there was a date that the commitment letter was due. It's and again, scary. like you said, to no fault of their own, right? Not I, I do place the blame on the abundance of brokers out there that just want licenses, right? If I've spoken to many of brokers who said, well, if I bring on enough agents, they're going to sell their cousin's house, their mother's house, or their own house eventually, and it doesn't cost me anything to have them on board, so what's the harm in bringing on another agent? And I think that's when my eyes were open to really just the things that need to change in this business. You can only yeah. throw so much shit at the wall and expect it to stick, yeah. but you're still going to have shit on your wall at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. You yeah, know? that's a great so way to put it. I, I think that brokers for a long time, and, and, and look, the ante to get in, we've discussed this before, but maybe we should just put it out there. Like, we're not looking to drive anyone out of the business. If yeah. you're a friend of ours, we want to see you stick around, uh, but it's too cheap. You know, it's, it's it's the equivalent of like a two cent ante in a poker game in a casino. Like, right. what do you the the, the bar to entry so low? It's really like if you've got six hundred dollars, you can get your real estate license. Yeah, right. and seventy five hours to spare. Seventy five hours to spare, you can get your real estate license. Right? Yeah, and hey, granted, thankfully, I was able to get in. Right, like the bar to entry was low. Didn't need that degree. Did you know? I actually got in. I was broke as could be, and I borrowed the six hundred bucks to make it work. Right, but. This is why the failure rate, the attrition rate is so high, is because agents don't realize they run a business. Right. And they don't have to, right? Like, just to pause there for a second, because a lot of people think that, but that's okay. I I encourage the employee type real estate agent. I think there's a place for you in the world. Let's find the right place for you. Yeah. 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 It's on a team. If you don't know the answer to that (laughs) question, it's on a team. team. Right? Because those those who actually want to take care of the business aspect of running a real estate business, uh, they they are more the broker type personalities. And and we can both agree that um, you know, some people are out there running brokerages with an agent mindset. You know, they, they, they want to go home, they don't want to stay and work, they don't want to do the training, um, you know, and and unfortunately, like, the world's changing pretty quick in front of us, right? Yeah. So it's not their fault. I think they tried to keep up as best as they could, mm-hmm. um, but the landscape on how we do business has changed dramatically. Absolutely. Absolutely. So first you got to teach them all the traditional stuff, and then you have to try to adapt to what's going actually on in the sales world that we live in today. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where brokers are getting lost. And I'll, 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 yeah. I'll go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say too, and, and I don't want it to look like uh, we were shitting on Cobalt Banker for a minute there, right? Because no. in all honesty, great training at the company that we were at. Yeah. He had that 17 week training schedule. Yeah. And if you missed it your first time around on week 18, it's repeated, right? And you can come back. And I saw that being operated at a great level, but it's not. Cobalt Banker does it well, this one doesn't, that one does, right? It, it comes down to the broker. It comes down to who's running that office, who's managing the office, and who's leading that training to make sure you're getting the right training, all right? So, yeah. like you said, they're teaching them some of the traditional methods, teaching them some of today's methods. They have to build that foundation. They have to learn this is a business. This is how we operate this business. There is no reinventing the wheel. There is no new idea that's going to change the world. This is how we do it. And and in some respects, there might be a new way of doing the business. And I think some of them are getting lost on that shiny object, if you will. You know, like trying to figure out, like, how to create the next big social media post that will sell all your real estate. Um, you know, it's great, but you're also, in the meantime, like, you're forgetting how to teach your agents how to write a binder. Yeah. Um, you know, or, or, or how to fill out a property condition disclosure. Yeah, but I, I would argue, and I know other brokers out there would argue, too, does the agent really need to know how to write a binder 
can't we just have an admin write that binder and they go out and sell another house? They go out and find another client. They go out and get another listing, right? Yeah, in, in some ways, I, I think that um, the world of virtual assistants has opened up nope. a variety for what we can do. I don't know what you're allowed to and not allowed to do as far as a VA you, goes, you license. license yeah, not, yeah, right. for writing that. I would assume that presenting it, you need to, but, you know, but to anybody fill can fill in. Yeah, fill right. It's kind of the argument I make about attorneys all the time in contracts. <laughs> like, just send them to me. I'll fill in the blanks. Right. Okay? Like, um, but, yeah, yeah, we can certainly delegate some of those other portions, but I... I I, I think what it comes down to for new agents, especially navigating a few things. And I, I, you mentioned before that you started out and you were broke and you had to borrow the six hundred dollars. And I think that um, I don't think anyone rich decides that they're that bored that they go and get their real estate license and decide that they want to put a buyer in their car and drive them around <laughs> because sure. they're that bored. Sure. Um, I would argue that a lot of people who get into real estate come into the avenue that we came through, whereas not that we didn't have options, but we wanted an option that really gave us the ability to match a doctor's or a lawyer's income. Right. You can't do that as a manager in a retail environment. Right. And when you've positioned yourself for retail for the rest of your life, and well, sales now opens up a door for you that says, look, you don't have to work behind a cash register and punch a nine to five, there is this world. Let me show you. You make your own right. schedule. You make high commissions. I think one of the first sales gigs I ever had was uh, selling knockoff perfume out of my backpack. And I remember the sales manager. And that was like little like boiler room, rah, rah, rah. Stick you in a truck. Drop you in the middle of Queens for eight hours with 25 perfumes in your backpack. Yeah. And we'll pick you up eight hours later. You better have sold them all, right? And here's yeah. the pitch. But he had, he had said something that stuck with me. And I, I was probably 19 years old when I had that gig. And it's stuck with me my whole life is 98% of the money is controlled by the 2% of people who are actually in direct sales. Yeah. Right. And that's always stuck with me. Like sales is where the money is. Yeah. What type of sales do I want to get into? Right. Yeah. And and so the money aspect, um, I'm not knocking any big name brokers. Okay. These large franchises and stuff, they definitely have their place in some communities for some people. Um, but like you were saying before, I think the biggest issue as a new agent that people face is you have to make money. But money for us was described as something different. It wasn't just that you earn the money, you earn the right to make more money, which is really hilarious living in America, right? Like, you know, I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, I can, I can earn as much as I want to. Like, those commission splits matter. And without getting into, like, different brokerages, all I can say to new agents listening to this, saying to themselves, like, oh, God, Kyle and Anthony, do what works for you, but at the same time, be conscious of how much money you're actually taking home. Well, I've always said there's room for every model. Every model works, right? The models aren't broken. I remember moving over to Realty Connect, and listen, we'll put it out there. Realty Connect offers 90% right off the bat. doesn't matter if you're brand new, you've been in this business forever, they offer 90%, right? And... I remember other agents that I came on board with going, how is Coldwell going to stay in business when Realty Connect's offering 90%? Yeah. It's because there's room for every model. Yeah. It, there's room, there's an ass for every seat, right? A lid for every jar. And agents will find what suits them best. Right. I think the evolution of the brokerage is what's going to change all the models completely. Yeah, and I think that that's probably why you and I landed where we ended up, right? Um, is is the evolution of real estate, and um, you know they, they always make the the analogy of saying that you know EXP is sort of that Netflix to the blockbuster, right? Um, you know, and and not that I would refer to any of the big names as the blockbuster, but the way they're training their agents or they're going about the back-end systems and stuff is no. very blockbuster-ish. No. And I think that it's a costly model to uphold, right, if you're the franchise owner. I know speaking, like, trying to buy a franchise, and it was like, oh, if you're offering any more than 70%, you're actually losing on your agent. You know, we, can, yeah. we can't do that model. It's so, not sustainable. Exactly. Well, so, a lot of the brokerages have proven it is sustainable. And, and, and some of the brokers that we like, that we've worked for in the past, I feel like they get handcuffed yep. because of that, that, right? So... Here's what I can tell you, and, and this is 
just my own personal opinion. Um, if you read the Allegory of the Cave by Plato, okay, it speaks about... I, I didn't go to college. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. This is not learned itself. Here. This was learned after I got into real estate. Someone opened my eyes up. Um, but it's really helped me understand better. The Allegory of the Cave speaks about people who were... And I'm going to butcher the hell out of this story and really shorten it up. Read Go it for if you it. want the full pa- thing. Paraphrase, paraphrase, yeah. paraphrase. Reader's Digest <laughs> in a real way, okay? But it's um, it, it speaks about people who are chained together and they're facing a wall, right? And they stare at these really scary shadows on the wall all day. And they're told, well, you don't want to go out there, right? Because it's dangerous, right? And then one day, one guy, like, brave, turns around and realizes that it's a shadow being made by a man exactly like himself, okay? And when I heard that story, it was like, I don't know why, like, brokerages. Like, it just, it, it like, it snapped in my head. And I think it's because, like, with every broker, whenever I've moved, right, and I've probably oh, moved more than most. You're, you'll be back. Don't worry. Not, you're you're just, fail. not you're even just like, that. But, like, they, they, they're like, listen, when you go out there, this is what's going to happen. They're not going to be as nice as us. I can tell Look you. Look out for that big, bad wolf. And I can tell you without, without any doubt in the world that that is the lie. So that's why I think new agents that don't have much experience, some can walk right into the scene and sell 280 houses and not blink twice with doing it because they don't fall into that. Yeah. Well, you had to work at this place and, and earn... And learn it and get here. And yeah, get yeah, yeah, and eat shit for five years and, hey, Anthony, can you come fix the copy machine? And, <laughs> you know, and all the things I got stuck doing at places I won't name but never made me money. And they were good people, like... I won't say a damn thing about any of them as people. Right. But, but they, were, they were stuck in what they were given, what they were handcuffed to. So, you know. And let's talk a little bit about that, about the evolution of the brokerage. The models are changing. Yeah. Um, you and I have talked about this in the past, like what I think the future of real estate looks like. And I could be completely wrong. Right. But I really do believe over the course of the next seven to ten years, we're going to see a drastic shift to obviously the technology broker, Right. And you look at the, Sirhan. Sirhan just released his yeah. own version of EXP World. Nice right. try, Ryan. <laughs> it's a, been there, done that. We're doing it already. You know? um, no, but I think there's going to be five key players in the game, and I don't want to name them outright. Right. But I think there's going to be the Zillow esque brokerage. I think there's going to be the Redfin esque brokerage, and I think there's there's going to be acquisitions, and there's going to be you know. Brokerages that just say, I'm out of this, I can't play this game anymore the way it's being played. Um, so I think there's going to be like five at the top. And maybe Realogy, I mean, listen, if you guys do it, you heard it here from me. I just want a little bit of kickback. Maybe Realogy consolidates their five brands and they say, you know, we are just this brand. Right. And, and this is what we offer because I think there's going to be five at the top. And I think there's going to be nobody in the middle and then very niche very, very niche small boutique brokerages are going to be the only ones that play their little lake resort town very well or, you know, the, whatever their little niche is. And then the big oligopies <laughs> just kind of <laughs> taking over and running the world. You know, I, I guess um, I, I would have to agree with that uh, to some extent because you, you know that players like Google and Amazon are looking to figure it out, right? Yeah. If you can buy it now, Right, and well, put it in your cart on Amazon and just, grab a house. Just before the pandemic, Amazon signed a deal with Realogy, right? And it was like the biggest news of 2018 to 2019 or whenever that happened. And I think people kind of forgot about it, right? We got a pandemic. We got you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, some yeah. other things happened there that exactly. Uh, right. Let's not sleep on what Amazon might be doing right now or what Google might be doing right, right. now. Right, right. Yeah. So I guess I'm I guess I'm okay with it as long as you know Google promises to give me a job in the future um you know it'd be okay if amazon wants to change the landscape of real estate as long as they understand that i I had this conversation with a buyer today and she was like oh my god no one's ever really put it that way before and i always use the analogy of dating and real estate dating Mm -hmm. and real estate dating and real estate you fall in love with the house you fall in love with the person you date a bunch of schmucks you see a bunch of crappy houses like it just goes hand in hand and um, she said very plainly that she didn't really have an interest in talking to real estate agents before, but getting an actual education on like what happens if you lose your job when you go under contract, 
we can get you your down payment back, we'll get you a denial letter from the bank. Like, then started seeing the value of working with a real estate agent. When people realize the gravity of the purchase that they're about to make, they're always going to look for guidance. Yep. And I just don't know that there's ever going to be like the way of the travel agent. I don't know that a button is going to replace yeah. us. I think we're always going to have a necessary place. It's a relationship business. It's the face-to-face. It's the hand-holding. It's the getting you through the process. But I, I would, I would be. I would be shocked if we didn't see a company like, like I don't want to say Zillow, <laughs> uh, like Amazon. Right? <laughs> Amazon, this is where I thought, because I thought the same thing you did, but I said, what happens if Amazon went and bought all the mortgages? Right. What if Jeff Bezos just got into the business of buying mortgages? And then we got a basic fundamental understanding of the fact that you don't own your house until it's paid off. Yep. Okay? So now Jeff Bezos owns your house. <laughs> okay, and let's decide you foreclose. And Jeff decides, okay, I'm going to list your house on Amazon. It's my house it's my to house. do that. Right. I am the deed owner of it. Could be a scary future we walk into. Jeff, if, don't listen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> could be a scary future we walk into if a company or a person of that magnitude decides to start buying the notes. Yep. Um, until that happens, I think capitalistic America is always going to play through and. A company like ours, like EXP, is able to break 75,000 agents when some people said, like, what the hell are you doing? Right. Um, you know, and then you see bigger companies like Century 21 that have been around for decades uh, that are really prevalent in some countries, just not so much Long Island anymore, yeah. where they're kind of getting pushed it, out and squeezed it, that, out. That's an interesting conversation, too, is, you know, I've, I've met agents from all over the U.S., and... In some areas, C twenty one is the big player. Some areas, CB is the big player. Other areas, EXP is the big player. So there is no. It, it is kind of geographic, and I think EXP is really just starting to break into New York. So we've been here eight years, yeah. but it's really just starting to break into New York and Long Island territory, right? And I think that's the opportunity that we both saw the yeah. last company coming over. Yeah, yeah, and 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 as a as a starting agent, right? Uh, going back to the new agent philosophy, there's so much training. Uh, either through EXP World or if you're joining a team or any one of your upline members, join a good downline. Don't join a downline with no training. Um, <laughs> join a good Don't just join because it sounded good and Exactly. <laughs> uh, get, get the training that it offers out of it. But there's so much training uh, coupled with an 80% split for like a new agent. Right. And that's when I think about it and I say to myself, like, damn, like, too bad something like that wasn't around for like the you and me's of 10 years ago. Who borrowed the six hundred dollars? Glenn Sanford talking to Ricky Carruth, and Ricky Carruth said, "Oh my God, what am I doing wrong? Glenn, yeah. We didn't exist for you. you know, now, now we exist." Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and I, <laughs> I I look at that and I say, like, you know, to anyone listening, that maybe money is tight, and you're trying to figure this shit out. And if you even want to stay in real estate, I'm going to tell you right now that don't give up on real estate change how much you're taking home yeah it'll it'll change a lot for and, you and change change what you're hearing what you're ingesting what what you're learning right like in order to change your output you got to change your input yeah that zig ziglar uses I mean, this, everybody's teaching the same thing right but i i loved growing up listening to zig ziglar yeah hey, so, you have you a little know, zig ziglar voice going on i think so yeah, it's, it's got <laughs> a little that yeah, <laughs> I gotta add a little southern drawl as exactly, I continue, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. but yeah. So in order to change your output, you got to change your input, right? Your output is based on your actions. Your actions are based on your your feelings and your emotions. Your emotions are based on what you're putting into it, what you're reading, what you're ingesting, what you're watching on a daily basis, right? I talk to my team all the time about, hey guys, here's something else I just watched. Here's something else I just read. Here's something else I just listened to. Constantly trying to feed and learn and build. Yeah, the the uh, the block and the negativity is yeah. is a tough one for a lot of people. It's not an easy thing to do, um, but it, it's it's so necessary. And I and 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 you know, even fifteen years in, like I still find myself getting caught. You know, the stinking thinking patterns, right? <laughs> and uh, I I have a couple of surefire ways of breaking them. Um, you know, if you like motivational stuff. Tony Robbins has never done it for me. I'm sorry, Tony. Um, but Eric He's Tom- not your guru. No, he's not. <laughs> Eric Thomas all day long, though, can beat it into my head day after day after day. And yeah, like he too. Okay. Yep, yep. And Eric Thomas, uh, I-, I will put on a little Eric Thomas. And um, I-, I will also, I'll watch the news. Oh. And that might seem like bad news. That's the, yeah, that's the opposite of my advice. But, <laughs> but I watch the news to gain and perspective. To say, hey, I don't have it that bad. To gain perspective. Yeah. Like 
I, t- I tell you right now, there's always a news article that's worse than what you had happen that day. Unless you are the news that article. That happens to me. <laughs> Driving down the expressway and seeing like an old beat up Toyota Tercel, you know, with uh, the spare donut on the back and the uh, grocery bags full of laundry sitting in the back window that you can see. Like, you know what? Like, there's always somebody who's got it worse than you. There's always somebody who's, who's not in your shoes. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it gain that perspective. Yeah. Right, if that's what you use it. Yeah. For. So, so whatever you, you know. Don't get drawn into it. Don't feel bad for the news. Right. News is the news. Yeah. But uh, you got to gain perspective every once in a while. Like, uh, Bryn Elliott, <clears throat> we used to joke around a lot, and he used to say, like, dude, my grandfather was a coal miner. How great do we have it? <laughs> that we are not, right? Like, living in the dark every day. Yeah. Like, it, it's so true. It's so true. And Listen, I, I feel the same I love, way. I love my parents, but I said, my mom was a school bus driver. My dad was a deli clerk. Like, their, their entire careers, you yeah. know? and. I told them what I made last year. My father almost had a heart attack. I don't want to kill you, that. <laughs> you know. But yeah. So you can make sure you put some of that money away. You know. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah, like yeah. and, and, and uh, exactly right. Yeah, your 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 upbringing and your 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 background helps too. Yeah. Um, but for the people, like for the younger people that don't see that yet, it, it's hard to gain perspective. You know. I mean, take a look at everything that's going on in the world right now. It, it helps. But what, what you bring home your first year in real estate is always an eye-opener. So take, it's a, tough. take a look at what's going on in the world right now. Don't yeah. let it affect you. Don't let it dictate your emotion going into this, right? Like, yeah. it, I have agents that were just so absorbed in the news and so absorbed in the politics. And I said, that, we can't change that. That's what's happening. What we can change is how we react and what we do on a daily basis in our business, and that's what we need to focus on. Solid advice, man. And 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 you know, I I, I don't have it all figured out. I don't think anybody does, right? But but the the turning the noise off yeah. as a real estate agent, especially when you're just getting started, you have to do it because yeah. if if you don't, it's going to drown you. I, th- I think this right here is why we started teams right i've yeah. talked to other team leaders team leaders have been around longer um the evolution of the team the team started with the agent that just needed help yeah the agent that couldn't do it all on their own right so they partnered up with somebody yeah and then they got an admin and then they grew from there now i, I know you and i have formed these teams because we wanted to be a support system. Oh, dude, I like we liberating want... people out of full time jobs. Yeah. That's that's right, that's like, my thing. Like, come like, here. Where, where do you show work? Show you. Like, where do you work? We're, we're quitting that job. Yeah, right. yeah we're quitting that I'm job. Getting the agent under my wing and just like showing them, hey, there's a bigger, better opportunity out there for you, and then just watching them succeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and 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 be able to really focus on the most important things in their life. You know, one of the guys on my team right now uh, left the retail industry to come here and do this full-time and you know he's a full-time single dad um you know he does the buses the lunches the after schools the this and that you know there's i feel you i'm not single but i feel you. i say it to him, i say it to him all the time i'm like you know could you imagine working another job that would give you the freedom that you do that you have here never and he says every day he's like this is the best job i have ever had and and it's not a job it's a career mm-hmm. we set our own hours we do our own thing but at the end of the day, like, I I couldn't imagine being in a position where I had to support a family and doing it any other way if I actually had to be around. I don't know what I, you'd do. I know your father was in the trades, right? And when, we first, met, yeah. when we first met, you were helping your dad on, on stuff, right? And, yeah. like, I've swung the hammer for a long time. I've bartended for a long time. I mean, again, I'd love to get the list of everything that we've done because we've worked it all, you know, from building pools to detailing boats to yeah. you know, done it all out there. Yeah. And actually, my, my six-year-old this morning uh, got up a little early, you know, which, is, which is amazing because it was right after the break, you know, but uh, got up a little early, yeah, and he's, he's laying in my bed, took over my spot, while my, my three-year-old's laying next to him in my wife's spot. She's getting ready to go to work, and I'm on my phone just taking care of some emails. It's probably about 6, 6.30 in the morning. And my six-year-old sits up and says, hey, Dad, why'd you choose real estate? Fantastic question, because that's the question I ask my agents when they join my team, right? Like, why'd you join real estate? And I I took that step back because it's been 12 years since I answered that question. I said, I chose real estate in the beginning because I wanted a flexible work schedule. I wanted to be able to make the big money. So my six-year-old says to me, so do, do you still feel that way? 
what is, what is my six year old doing right? He must be watching a lot of my podcasts or a lot of the stuff yeah. I'm putting out there. He's right? on the handsome home buyer podcast. Yeah. Trying so, to figure it out. Yeah, he, uh, maybe he fell asleep to Tom Ferry last yeah. night, you know, like I usually do. And uh, I was like, wow, like, do I still feel that way? I said, you know, it's actually given me more opportunity than I ever imagined. My schedule is nowhere near as flexible as I ever imagined. Okay, because I'm. Joke all the time. Oh, yeah, flexible schedule. Yeah, you're flexible on your clients' needs, right? When they need you, yeah. you're available. Um, but I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. I would not go back to swinging a hammer. I love the fact that, God forbid, everything crashed and real estate turned into something that's just not something I want to do anymore. I could go swing a hammer. I could go 10 more. I could do, do the yeah. other things. But I don't want to go back to that. Yeah. And even after the pandemic, you know, leading up to the pandemic, I was still kind of bartending on call Friday, Saturday nights, you know, popular spot in town, only if they needed me, only if I wanted to be there. The spot the bartender wants to get to, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I'm working the good shifts when I want to. Right. And then after the pandemic, they opened back up and they called me in for a shift. And my first shift on, I was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. I, I, I don't care how much money I'm going to make doing this or what I'm doing on a Friday night. I'd rather be home with my wife and kids. I'd rather be watching a movie with them right now than you know going to sling drinks or swing a hammer. So you know, I'm glad I have that behind me. But real estate has just afforded me so many more opportunities out there. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I don't know about you, but uh, I, I I look back and I laugh and I'm like, I wouldn't have a life. I wouldn't have friends. I wouldn't have half the people that are in my life watching this today right. if it wasn't actually for real estate. So in a lot of ways, like it, it really did save me. Um, I'd have been a lost cause for sure. Uh, definitely would have gotten into trouble. Um, was it, half of my friends are dead, the other half are in jail. So you know, like no, I, yeah, yeah. I, I know where I could have been. I know, yeah, you know, I know yes. what I was doing before I, I made the switch. So and yeah. it was, it was great. And I, you know, listen, I, I had to. Um, Sometimes it takes a lot to remember that question. Mm -hmm. I like I walked away from the industry for like almost a full two years. Like it was a long time. Like right. I took what all of 2018 and most of 2019 and just didn't do it. I was just like not in it. Right. I couldn't bring myself to do the prospecting. I couldn't bring myself to one. What was it? Because because you've always been fairly successful. Let's let's yeah. yeah like you can make it. I, all right. So here's the thing. And and you can have different opinions on this. Lord knows I support my team members that have different opinions on this. But for me personally, I find this to be a very stressful job. It's very stressful. Uh, yeah. <laughs> have you seen okay. the white in my it's, beard? I mean, you're a bit younger than me. It's but. <laughs> very stressful. Yep. It's got to be worth it. And when you're making what I could have been making as like a manager at Walmart and I would have been laughing every day at work, right? Mm -hmm. It's not worth it for me. For other people, it is, and I, I want to like really, really position this when I'm because we're talking about me here. Right. I'm not I, judging oh, anyone. I do, I do say to other agents, if you're going to make thirty six thousand dollars a year, go work at Kohl's. But no, I don't want to work at Kohl's to make thirty six. I want to make thirty six here. Because okay. to be honest with you, to make thirty six in real estate, like you might only have to sell five houses. That's like you could, have. you could work every other month. I always think about Sean Huff from Huff and Gadis. He used to tell me about we had one agent in the office who had a goal of making forty thousand dollars a year. Came in, worked two months, made the forty, never came back for ten months out of the year. Yeah. Right. So like some people just do it smart. I have agents on my team that this is their part time gig. They have a goal to make fifty thousand dollars part time. Right. to add that to their income they'll get close they'll do it I know they will but for me the stress of having to do that it wasn't worth it for me so I, I took a break just to realign and um, you can't avoid your calling yeah okay what, what'd you do during that break I sold appliances okay. I'll always sell it's never gonna stop okay. uh, a good friend of mine owns uh, Red's Appliance over in Farmingdale and I went to him with this exact conversation he's like why don't you come here He's like, it's actually, it's a lot <laughs> it's not, nicer. And that's stressful to sell a stove. Or well, a you know, when, when you get a, there's something about the immediate gratification of selling something and getting paid for it right then and right. there, um, which you lose in real estate. Yeah. That was there. The consistency of pay was there, right? Kind of gave you peace of mind because you're not worrying about your next paycheck the way you do in real estate sometimes. Um, but I also was punching a clock. Mm. I also was working days that I really didn't want to work. No. I was... Better be there for the Memorial Day sale. <laughs> I was working hours that I wasn't loving. I was driving uh, back and forth from Farmingdale to Holtzville. 
uh, every day through rush hour traffic, right. hit a pothole or two on the way. I started to remember, why did I get into real estate? Right? <laughs> I actually, I started to fall in love with it again. And yeah. then, to make matters worse, I was sitting there and people would come in and be like, Anthony? <laughs> right? I bought my house off like, of you. Now you're selling a refrigerator? Like, it was yeah. almost like yeah. they found me like sitting on the corner with a cup in my hand. Yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like, it, like guys, I'm working. Oh. Like, I'm employed here. Like, what is wrong with you? I got because I bumped into an old agent, not going to mention names right now. You know him um, at Lowe's the other day. Yeah. And I almost felt that way. Like, and I, and I sincerely did not want to make him feel like yeah. bad about it. What's yeah. I was just like, oh my God, like, what are you doing here? Yeah. You know, because you saw that they, they were selling houses. They well, they were a good agent. Like, what made them go to Lowe's? I always yeah. laugh. It's like the one-hit wonders. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, you made a song. You went famous. But, guy, you work at Walmart. <laughs> like, like this is your job now. Like, you know? Yeah. And, and they have to say it out loud. Like, yeah, I was famous once, but yeah. you got to pay your bills. It's so exactly the same way in real estate. So that was... And then more through the conversations. And then because you can't change who you are, yeah. I started, like pulling clients <laughs> out of the store. Hey, you know I also have my real estate license. Exactly right. Exactly right. And uh, and then it, it just, it, in a weird way, um, the people who came back, so the first time I ever attempted a team was in 2010. Okay. Uh, the person who was on that team is... Long before the, teams were really the big thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, shout out Craig Proctor, who has been talking teams yep. long before most people. Um, the guy who owns the appliance store was on that team in 2010 <laughs> and I took a girl her name was Bianca um, from Geico she was a claims adjuster and she got into real estate and started selling houses and the three of us formed the first A team the AC and Associates before they abandoned Associates <laughs> and uh, use that yeah exactly <laughs> and uh, and we, we, we pushed forward and that was really the first experience I had with a team and like all teams, you know, like like any major band where all people can play separately and have no reason to be on a band, we came to the agreement that it was time for Just us to all go yeah. solo, yeah. right? So we did our own uh, Justin Timberlakes, we went solo, and then I, I started putting the pieces back together and rebuilding and rebuilding and then went independent for a while. Um, so it was really weird to me that I left the industry, I walked away, I said F these people to a lot of the people we work with, um, remove them like all off Facebook and everything, like really just done. And uh, sure as shit, sitting in that store, listings kept coming in, <laughs> and then two agents approached me and asked me if I was like forming a team and if I would be interested in helping them. That was it. That was it. Yeah. And then it hit a weird point where... In my business account, I had the equivalent of what I was set to make working all year at the appliance store. Right. And a uh, pandemic hit. I was going to say, so that was 18, 19 that you gave it up, so you came back and... Well, pandemic gave me a really easy conversation to have because yeah. instead of like quitting my friend's job that I felt very obligated that he gave me and gave me an opportunity to be there and I didn't want to let him down, right. uh, he was like, hey... Uh, Can't afford to keep you on anymore. Well, not even that. He's like, I, I got to pick and choose who can come, who can go. And then when you come back, I'm trying to figure out, like, I don't know if I need this many salespeople. And we were just like, we were always trying to figure out my place okay. there. And I think the reason why I couldn't find a place there is I really just never belonged. Yep. Um, you know, I, I, I've been meant to do what I've been doing, and that is helping people. And then... God, looking back on it, like, I don't even remember how it happened first, but it was, I mean, the, the 10 people that I have on my team now that I feel very blessed for, it all happened very fast. And it happened like, you know, God just kept shoving me, and I'm not an overly religious person, but sometimes you got to give credit where credit's due, and yeah. I was not pulling this cart. It was being pulled by its own little That's thing. Awesome. And, you know... But you said that you're calling, right? Like, isn't that a great feeling? Right, like wow, like this this is where I need to be going. Not only was it a great feeling, but it was really sobering after he stopped helping. Because he's like, All right, I got you back got in, you the door is back open, yep. you're either gonna keep yourself in here or not. Yep. And that's when the real work started again, you know, and, and, and as a as a real estate agent you have to know what that real work is. And it was, and it was a reset and you no longer made that Walmart salary. 
right? Now all of a sudden you, you're killing it. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you're making real money. Yeah. In a business that you love. Yeah, and I got to show others how to thrive it. I got to call my own shots finally. Yep. You know, if, before that transition of, of moving over to the appliance store and taking that break, I was on teams, mm-hmm. right? And then I was in the position to run my own team. And then I actually had the money to run my own team. And then I got to start making my own decisions and saying, like, well, we're actually going to allocate money towards this and, mm-hmm. and that. And as that all started to unfold, I realized, like, you know, I'm, I'm living a 10-year-old dream at this point, you know, in the way of getting everything to work, you know, having this set up and what we have here today and the agents that I have on my team and the work that we do. Um, you know, it's, it's surreal to me still. I still actually don't know how I keep up with my well, monthly you budget. Just, you just put your head down, I, you work forward, and you just... You just I, don't, I don't know how it works. I, yeah. I am... I am Still at my core, we, the guy. You said something there that you, you had the money to be able to do it, right? Because I think what a lot of people aren't realizing is a team doesn't just mean a couple people working together, right? It, it could. It could. It could, but without resources but a, to run a business. A hard. true team, in my opinion, you know, we're talking our opinions here, there's a leader, there's a budget, there's a plan, there's a goal, right, for everybody. There's there's training on how to achieve those goals. Like, there needs to be a system in place. Yeah. Not just, oh, I need some help and I'm going to pair up with somebody. Or, even worse, what I see now is newer agents going, oh, yeah, we're working together and we're a team. How horrible is it that we have two agents that don't know what they're doing, yeah. calling themselves a team and going out there and misguiding the public, unfortunately. The, the, the blind leading the blind, more right. or less. Um, you know, Am I right about this rule? You tell me, Kyle. Here, here. I'm here. a stats guy. Here, here, we all know. You're the professional yeah. rule. <laughs> I tend to just apparently spew shit that I'm wrong about, so <laughs> we're going to keep that from happening. No, so I'll ask you. Um, I was under the impression you had to be a broker in order to have a team. No. I mean, rules must have changed. Uh, it, it was so, brokers only could run a team. To, and I'll tell part, you why. The part of the state doesn't even recognize what a team is. Okay. Right? So there's just guidance that has Got come it. from legal department. Uh, up at NISAR, and and based on our conversations with Department of State, um, no, it, it, that's that's a fallacy. Here's why I would be okay with but, that, though. But I prefer, yeah, right. Yeah. Like, I didn't start my team until I became an associate broker, right? Because th- th- there's a level of operation that needs to go into it. Yeah, there's a level well, of knowledge that needs to go into it. Let's just talk about the point system to get your broker's license. It requires sales, <laughs> right? Right, like like got to sell some houses. So in order to start a team, you should have probably at least sold the benchmark amount to get your broker's license. And I think it requires two years in the business. No. Yep. Right, in order to get your broker's license, two years in the business. I think, don't quote me on it, but I think we just shifted that to three years in the business. Great, yeah. right? And like 8,500 points or whatever it was, okay, which, you know. And I know we're reviewing the point system now. So, like, we're, listen, we're, we're trying to change it. But when I say we, I'm on every committee known to man on the right. local, state, and national level. And this is all part of uh, professional, not professional standards, but um, our education committee up at uh, NISAR that works basically side by side with Department of State to say, here's the education requirements that we believe right. you should have, and DOS says, yeah, we agree or we don't, we're gonna make that rule. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting. I, I, I've listened to a lot of your material and, and some of your content that you've put out, and, and you, you've said it a handful of times, like we really are self-governed. You know, mm-hmm. like it, a lot of it falls down to us, and I know that, you know, obviously snitches get stitches, <laughs> so we don't wanna be running around, getting each other in trouble. This. Um, but at, at the at the same we have respect, to police ourselves. we have to. If we don't, we're going to lose that right. We're going to lose that ability. So. Yeah, which which you know, we'll, we'll we'll shift a little bit. So for new agents right now, right? Because that seems to be our topic tonight. Yeah. New agents for new agents right now that are out there running around placing offers and stuff. Um, somebody said to me the other day in like a very defeated tone. They were like, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not our offer was presented. If it wasn't the best and highest, we just not getting the deal. Do you agree with you, that statement? No, not at all. And I th- you and I had a conversation, I think, like about a week ago, maybe, uh, a little bit on that topic about how to present an offer. Right? Th- th- there's a way in which an offer needs to be presented. And actually, it came it came through one of my agents who was a newbie uh, with a different broker at one of my open houses a l- about a year ago now. Um, submitted an offer and just looking at his offer I was like this agent has no idea what they're doing they yeah. need some help 
I'm going to reach out to them on that level. Say, hey, your offer's not accepted. Here's why. And I think you can use some guidance on, on how to write an offer. Let's chat. Now he's an agent on my team. He's got his fifth or sixth deal under contract. Nice. Um, but he came to me and said, um, I, I need some guidance on why my offers are not getting accepted. I, we're presenting offers left and right. Uh, I haven't had anything accepted lately. You know, Can you give me some guidance on that? So I sat down with him and I said, okay, I'm going to go in the other room. Tell me the property that you're looking at. I'm going to pretend I'm the listing agent, and I want you to present your offer to me. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, you're going to call me up, and you're going to present this offer to me. He goes, okay. And I go in the other room, and he goes, does it matter that I've never really called the listing agent before to present the offer? <laughs> I came back in the room, and I go, okay. So we're not doing that little role-playing exercise. Let's talk about how to present an offer. Yeah. Let's talk about what this means. Next day, two offers accepted. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So if you're a new agent, how are you presenting that offer? Like, guys, don't just email us your 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 offer. Don't just push send on the email and assume. um, Our good friend Amy and I were having this conversation today, and she got furious with me uh, (laughs) because you know I was saying like I I hate the handcuffs that we have to wear as far as like talking about the buyer and the personal circumstances with the buyer. I mean, technically speaking, we can talk on like three actual metrics about a buyer. Down payment. So I, I, right, I believe credit. in fair housing. It's this this pendulum swing, right? right. So, right. We're, so we're, in a, we're in a state now where everything is a fair housing violation. Right. Exactly. So, so I don't even say the buyer's name anymore. Right. Exactly. Because <laughs> you can just you can only do so much to avoid possible liability. Right. Obviously, her and I, and you yourself, we don't agree with all parts of that. We do do the right thing, though. Um, I was saying to her on how. Too many people are comfortable, like not getting their offer acknowledgement forms back, right? Or or not acknowledging that it has to be signed by the homeowner. Or worse, I saw a post today on MLS One Key. Six years in the business, I've never seen this offer acknowledgement form. What is this? Is it mandatory? Do I even have to respond to this from the listing agent? Yeah. So I home snapper. Yeah. 44 transactions, 44 listings, 16 buyers under contract or sold in the past two years on HomeSnap. So she's selling. Yeah. Right? It's not like an agent is, you know, six years in the business. No, she's selling. Yeah. Never saw an offer acknowledgement form. Well, yes, by the way, I submit them with every one of my offers. Yeah. And I make sure, hey, I'm sending you an offer acknowledgement form. Just make sure you get that back signed by your seller. Yeah, and I've had agents, right, of, of, of high caliber, right, shockingly enough, their even team leaders ask me if it's okay if their agent signs it and sends it back to me. <laughs> they wanted to check with LIBOR yeah. to see if yeah. it's okay. And yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah, said, that, like, it's... That's fine. Uh, we'll just uh, look at our code of ethics real quick. Yeah, the, the entire point of it is to get it shown to your seller. That's the entire point of that of that offer acknowledgement letter. So, you know, it, it's it's all good to like to like laugh about these things, and we do, right? Because of course, like, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Yeah, yeah, in a real way. But it's it's um, it's part of the industry that I'd like to see start to change piece by piece. And I think as um, as the tides change, right? As uh, generational wealth starts to be handed over, not only in personal lives but in business, uh, some of these brokers start to take retirement um, and things like that. Perhaps some of the ways and some of the things that are kind of like look the other way on will start to change a little bit. And, you know, I said to my buyer today, it'd be really great if uh, most offers came over with first right of refusal <laughs> and we just did the first one in the door gets the deal. Like, it, it's it, or the best and the actual highest gets the deal because when we have five offers that are yeah. all the same. I, I had a conversation with my brother-in-law uh, out of state. He's up in Massachusetts and uh, super, super intelligent, super educated, wealthy individual. And um, he was in a bidding war for a house that he was buying. And he was loving the fact that his agent put a time limit on when offers can be presented. Uh, the, and actually, he was using the listing agent to submit his offer as well, which was like, okay, we're, we're going to have a conversation going forward, John. But, <laughs> anyway, um, but he loved the fact that they had a time, and he actually won the bid because somebody else came in after the time limit. was. Just, and I said, That's actually a breach of that agent's code of ethics that they didn't present that offer. There's no such thing as setting a time limit on when yeah. your offer could come in. Right. The offer could come in the day before closing, yeah. and it must be presented to the seller. Yeah. 
All right, there is none of this. All offers by five o'clock Monday. No, 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 no. Yeah. By code of ethics, must be presented to the seller until yeah. closing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I have in my phone still, probably in my saved screenshots, the text message from an agent saying exactly that. Right. You know, offers due by Monday evening. I'm on the phone at six thirty on Monday night, by the way. <laughs> and she's like, "You're too late. You're too late." You know, and, I'm and, too late. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's go have a conversation with your seller. Exactly. Make sure they don't want to see my offer. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, to those agents out there that are taking the shit, don't. Definitely stand up for yourself. <laughs> Definitely stand up for yourself. Thank you very much. Kyle was nice enough to bring us a, a, a bottle of Cosmeos. I know you're the tequila guy. I am. I'm a whiskey guy. Tequila guy. Uh, <laughs> delicious, by the way. Um, but it, it's for new agents. It is the number one thing I see happening is what I like to call bullying mm -hmm. in this industry. Bullying the new agents, Absolutely. bullying them out. Nope, your offer's not going to get. Nope, we already got. Somebody said today, uh, we've already got you know 15 offers, $100,000 over asking price. That's nice. Awesome. You know, still going to present mine. Yeah, still going to present mine too, right? Mm -hmm. And then I get into the conversation many a times like, hey, listen, uh, please make sure that the inflection in your voice when presenting my is about excited it. as it is when you're dealing with the other offers. Because if not, I'm just going to point out that that's a form of discrimination as well. Mm -hmm. I hate to be that person. Like we were saying before, snitches get stitches. But let's talk about the reality of the situation that like some of this is like a freaking popularity contest. No. I've had agents tell me like, well, you're not playing nice, so we'll see. First off, don't ever tell me that. If you're watching this and you say that to me, that is the ding, ding, nice. ding. I came yeah. here to work for my client's best interest. Right. I'm a fiduciary. Right. That That is the ding, ding, ding for me to hear. And you will see the clause. I get... As people can say, I am a nice guy, but play by the rules, because I am such a stickler for, look, you just can't blatantly break code of ethics. All right. I told you about that one agent. I called you up and said, Kyle, how would you handle this? She's like, dude, I would call the board of ethics right now. <laughs> right? She like, right right out out told me she's just going to go too. talk to my seller, because she wasn't happy that she couldn't get in the house when she wanted to. Yeah. It's got to stop, right? And, and you started this with the the generation of brokers out there that hopefully will be starting to leave this business that aren't giving the training, aren't giving the right guidance to their or agents. Or better yet, governing these issues. Yeah. Governing these issues, right? I, I go back to and... and <laughs> Cheers. We're, try, we're trying to bite our tongue yeah, here we'll and not throw... No, no, anybody this, this under topic, the bus. This is a topic I think we could actually say tonight, though. <laughs> I think we can. It depends on how many more of these we have. We yeah, no, no. To I've, talk about, so. I've, I've had enough to throw this one out there, though. Do you know what I'm most shocked to say? That all the doors are still open to most of the brokers that were involved in the serious racism scandal that was sweeping across Long Island that Newsday felt the need to do an expose on. Yet, I am now understanding, okay, because one of the guests that was supposed to be on my podcast is one of the actresses that was hired to go about and Ooh. see what was happening under Governor Cuomo's task force. Okay. And she experienced the racism firsthand along with her partner that she was signed up with to go out there and investigate. And they just called her now, this is three years later, they just called her now. Bad news for all you guys, they're coming for your licenses. Yeah. This year, she's set up to go back into court. Uh, they're going to be going for the licenses of those people. And I can only assume that the brokers... As we said before, the liability of where the liability falls, falls back on those brokers. It was one reason I was happy to join EXP when I did, because we haven't been around for any of that, right. for anyone listening, wondering. Right. EXP was not caught in it, because we didn't exist when that shit was going down. No. The brokers that did, though, that just turned their back and said, like, oh, that's bad, what'd you do? Right. What kind of restitution was made for those buyers no. who were... I I will not comment, and I will put on record that I have no comment, because I was actually on the executive board of LIBOR when this all came to fruition, um, and on the grievance and professional standards committees. The one thing I will say is, rightfully so, our professional standards committee said, we cannot hear any of these cases. They must go elsewhere. They must go outside of our board so that there is no favoritism, there is no judgment coming from our board. So it's being reviewed by professional standards committees outside of our board, and this is why it's taking some time, and the pandemic, yeah, obviously. obviously yeah. This is why it's actually taking some time to finally come down, because I've actually 
spoken to, and not in length, but have spoken to some agents on professional status committees outside of our board that say that they're reviewing some of these things. I'm like, oh my God, what happened there? All right, I actually, I have my condo down in South Carolina, and my super in my condo uh, was getting his real estate license down there. And we got to talking a little bit, and he goes, uh, oh, Long Island. Our entire ethics portion of our licensing class is on the Newsday article. Right. This was a big deal yeah. that too many are trying to sweep under the rug. Yeah, and so they didn't take action on. So I, I only bring it up because I'd like to lump it into the same boat that says there's thirty one thousand of us because fucking half there, of us thirty eight now. Yeah, well, because <laughs> half of them haven't been caught. Yeah. Okay, and and when their day comes and the LIBOR numbers just like they did in two thousand and eight drop below twenty thousand again, which they will. I think that more new agents can start coming into the, the community, and I hope that if 20,000 of those licenses go missing, I hope a portion of them are people who hold on to these ideologies that, A, this like blue wall of silence nonsense that people try to do with one another regarding each other's offers, and oh, that's my friend, they'll try to get their buyer in. Guys, do the right thing. You're going to get caught. Oh. You're going to get caught. Do the right thing. Always. We have a code of ethics for a reason. We subscribe to a code for a reason. We are realtors for a reason. Not just licensed salespeople. Not just a real estate agent. There is a difference for anybody in the public that's watching this between a real estate agent and a realtor. Yeah. All right? and, and the fact of the matter is too many have never even seen the code of ethics outside of their licensing class. I have it hanging on the wall of my office. <laughs> hanging up behind me in my home. <laughs> we clearly don't have it here. But, uh, but the, the, the reality is, is that I, I, that is the one thing I'd like to see for new agents, new agents coming on. And I think that is exactly like you said before. It's the reason why we chose to run teams. Yeah. It's the reason why we chose to help people get a better understanding. Because, you know, if I can make just the tiniest bit of difference in what happens in the next 30 years in real estate, be different than it was how, in the last How do we clean years. it up? Well, it's going to start... With agents like us, and one agent at a time. And That's education. Yeah. And education. Listen, you educated me on like three or four different things tonight that I had in my head a completely different way. It's about having the conversation about it, getting the dialogue out there, and understanding it from a different perspective, because it's not all black and white what we do. Right. For the most part, a lot of it is. Um, but <laughs> a lot of it goes, actually, states right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is what you but, <laughs> but, but many of how to teach it is gray. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, the, the subject material is certain black and white. Do this, don't do that. And but I think uh, ISAR took a big step last year, and we've eliminated the grandfather clause. So brokers used to, if you were licensed pre-such-and-such date. Such 2007. Or I know. Yeah, because yeah, like, I got my license in 2007, <laughs> and I was like, no. That, that, well, put it this way. I was licensed after that, so it didn't fall under it no matter yeah. what, right? But, yeah, if you were licensed as a broker pre-2007, you did not need continuing education. Yeah, scary thing. Right. So the first they implemented, you must at least take the three hours of fair housing and code of ethics. Okay, we got that. Now we finally eliminated that grandfather clause. The, the sidebar to that is most of those brokers now will be out of the business anyway. Right? So, But we, we eliminated that where all brokers must do 22 and a half hours of continuing education just as every other agent out there does. I was shocked that they didn't force them to do what I had to do, which was to take the 30-hour gap take course. Take the 30-hour gap, right. You know? Like I just, do it. two years ago, got my associate broker's license. My broker's license, I'm associate broker now, but I had to do the 75-hour class, not the four, or the 45-hour class. Yeah, not the yeah so when I took the 45 licensing, so I had to take the 30-hour gap and then the 45-hour right. broker license course, right? right? So, so we're increasing, we're, we're trying to raise the bar by increasing that threshold, at least. The education part of it. And then the ante. And right, we said the ante. Yep. We up the ante. Listen, it's, I'm a proponent, and, and, and you said no, and other agents have told me, you got to call you crazy, but I'm a proponent of make it $10,000 a year to be an agent. Yeah, 10000 is a lot. I don't think I'm paying that. Make it $10,000. Include a lot. Include yeah, okay. the continuing ed. Include okay. a lot of the services right. that are ancillary, right? Yeah. But at least at a level, like after you've been licensed for three years, here it is. Because the argument is, oh, well, then the bar is too high, and you're, you're eliminating people's ability to get into the business. So, Okay, no, so after X amount of years, here's what it costs you to remain in business because, God, we'd eliminate 80% of the licenses right there. Yeah. But what does it, what does it cost you down to stay in business? Yeah, it's, it's way too cheap. Right. It's way too cheap. Um, so that, I, I think that that's, that's kind of probably what causes a lot of the confusion for new agents, and I think it scares 
and the reason why we have such a high turnover rate of new agents and why we lose so many in the beginning, what they make, what it costs. Agents are getting into the business. You say, why did I get into this? Why did you get yeah. into this? Why are agents getting into the business now? HGTV. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Right. These these shows are the million dollar listing, yeah. uh, selling sunset. Right. It makes it look so glamorous and right. so easy. Right. Right. And it's easy to get the license. Yeah. Okay. A couple bucks. Go take a class. Go take a test. Cool. I'm licensed. What they don't understand is what it takes to actually succeed in this business. Right. There are 38,000 licenses on Long Island right now. Yeah. When I was looking at the numbers recently, less than 1,200 of those licensees sold more than eight houses last year. Yeah. Which has always been the stat, though. If, if right? you sell like, eight houses, you're making thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, right? So yeah, with your average splits out there, right? There are 37,000 licensees out there selling less than seven homes, and half of them actually have never even sold a home. Yeah. All right? <laughs> so 19,000 of them don't even sell a house. It's The numbers are staggering. And when people say there's a lot of competition, so no, there's not. There's no competition. A lot of agents, but there's no competition. Right. right. There's very few of us at the top that are actually succeeding in this. Right. And then building a team under us and showing them how to be successful in doing it. Right. Right. And 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 I I like to I always like to look at the generational standpoints of people and things like that. We're very close in age. Um, but then there's gap. It's like yeah. a twenty. It's like a twenty year gap. Thirteen years ago, when I got into this business, the average age of a realtor was fifty-seven years old. I yeah. think it's down at fifty-two or fifty-three now. Yeah, right? and, and still I mean, kind of high. If you actually look at the producing agents, it's probably a lot younger. It's than probably that a lot too. younger yeah. in the production side. Yeah, but YPN, we discussed earlier, Young Professionals Network, right? You yeah. were one of the, the original directors of our YPN. Yeah, you know, when, it, when it first came into existence. Yeah, and that has a big to do with the newer agents, the younger agents getting in and finding the network, finding the training, finding the right people to surround themselves with and, and become successful at this. Yeah, which I, I, I actually, I haven't been to a YPN event in a really long time, which I do feel bad about, but uh, I hope um, at least what the goal for YPN was when it started um, was that it would be more than just a place to drink, um, <laughs> you know, and it would turn into a place for education. And I remember yeah. the first person that we brought down was Jared James. Jared, yeah. You know, and he did his uh, speech over at the Penny Saver building, and we realized then, like, you know, young young professionals have this responsibility um, to prepare themselves to inherit the business. Yeah. Right? Like, time ticks for everyone. No. It's not going away. I, I don't want to be here much longer. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I mean... I'm I ain't 43. Go, I ain't going anywhere. You guys got yeah, me. Yeah, no, no, you, you're you like guys, this. I'm doing this forever. I'm finding yeah. my way out. <laughs> you, guys, you guys got me as long as you've had all these brokers all on the island, plus 10 years. <laughs> I ain't going anywhere. I don't but, want to be the guy in the room saying I've been doing this for 30 years. And kudos to anybody that's in the room doing it for 30 plus years. I don't want to be that guy in the room. That's not my goal. And, 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 and I think that the responsibility falls on the shoulders of the agents who want... Right, stick around a little bit and say like, "Hey, like this, this has to change." But the um, just the evolution of time is going to change the landscape of the brokerage on Long Island. So, if you're a younger agent right now and you're picking mentors and people to follow and team leaders and stuff like that, like I've met a lot of really great people in my 15 years in this career. Mm-hmm. That was 15 years ago, though. Um, I with a friend of mine. Um, I was trying to explain to her that uh, she was asking, like, do you call your broker a lot? Do you call your broker a lot? Do you, do you call your manager a lot? It took a while um, after getting my broker's license, which I've had it now for seven years. It took a while after getting my broker's license to realize that I'm a broker now. Right. And I can only imagine it's kind of like what it's like being a student teacher. Like, you're, you're a student, but you're also in the room to be the teacher. Right. And even though you're the same age as the people that are on the other side of the desk of you, <laughs> that you're a- attempting to try and teach, you're the teacher you're in that teacher. capacity. And you might not feel it that way yet, but you are. And the knowledge that it took to get there, you have it. You pass the test. You hold You See, hold the name. I, I've always kind of had that feeling. I had a broker, solo practitioner broker. Um, I dated his sister when we were younger. Okay. We know each other. Um, always reaching out to me asking 
completely, you know, he, he's got his own solo practice going on. I was with Cobol at the time, right? asking me some advice on some stuff, and which you have done, other agents have done. I love being that source of information yeah. because I am the guy that's over involved. Um, but we got into a discussion one day, and he said, "How come you're not a broker yet?" And I said, "I don't know. Like, you know, I, I don't know if I really should do that." He goes, "Kyle, you know it all. You you have the ability to do it. Why right. don't you just do it?" And I always felt like, "Oh well, you know, there's got to be somebody that I could turn to. There's got to be somebody that I could turn to." Then I started realizing my broker was turning to me. My manager was turning to me. Others were turning to me. I said, yeah, I, I need to become a broker. I just didn't want to own the brokerage. Yeah. I, I, I don't want that. Yeah, li- liability is so, not yeah. an interest for most people. I don't so know that's, that's liable, landing at EXP was with the great fit there because yes. I can do what I do and not have to own the brokerage. Right. Um, but yeah, being a teacher, realizing you have what it takes. You have the knowledge. You have the ability. You do. I turn to my broker. There may be one or two things every now and then I got to turn to my broker for just to clarify. If not, I'm turning to legal over at NISAR. I'm turning to the president of the association yeah. and saying, "Hey, you know, these are the people I've surrounded myself with, so I can get the answers from the right people." Yeah. But it's it's only because they're still there to turn to. Right. Right. And and when time takes its toll. And the sun just turns a couple times more. Um, they won't be there to call anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that but, I don't. Not that, and, and we'll be the ones it, that the next generation is calling, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. By 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 order of operations, right? Yep. Um, so I have, after realizing that, I've just felt very responsible because a lot of people share my friend's mindset in the way that they always feel like they're going to need to call the adult in the room. Right. And uh, when you're in your forties, still looking for the adult in the room. <sighs> It, I am though. It doesn't take yeah. It doesn't take long <laughs> to realize around, I got shit. I'm the, the adult, adult in the room. Um, <laughs> I'm the adult in the room. So, so that 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 was my that was my biggest takeaway recently. Actually, is that um, you know not not in a disrespectful way, mm-hmm. in a very appreciative way, in a very hey, I hope that even after you leave the business and I run into this scenario, I can still call yep. and say hey. Did you run into this when you were in my position? What, what, what did you see? But better yet, um, like a lot of things in life, it's left open to interpretation. Mm-hmm. And how we're interpreting how this business should be worked is going to have a ripple effect in how it actually works. So I'm hoping that some of the issues we outlined here tonight that could just be frustrations and things like that, um, I think they're going to disappear. I think they're going to disappear because I think as we start to simplify and apply a little more common sense logic, which our generation has a lot of it, mm-hmm. um, we agree on the things like, um, I always, everyone knows, right, the language we're allowed to and not allowed to use in a listing, right? It's some of the most ridiculous Ho- things. Ho- hopefully. Right? It, yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Right? But to use the example that always comes to mind, because it's always my homeowner's request to like, oh, can you just put walk to beach? Yeah. Walking right. distance to the beach. Right. And and, and with no res- no disrespect to anyone who's handicapped and unable to walk, I want to know from their perspective, does reading that sentence really set Make them, them off? Make them feel like they are being discriminated against. Yeah, right? really set them <laughs> off to a point where they like feel like they can't buy that house because they won't be able to physically walk to that beach. Right. Because in my mind... And then we start trying to get creative. Stones throw. Yeah, what if you can't throw? If you don't have arms? What if you don't have stone, right? They can go down this all day long, right? Um, but I actually, I, I say to myself, like, isn't it discriminating against the handicapped person by assuming they don't want to stroll down to the beach? They may not be able to walk to do it, but walking is what we say when it's in close proximity. So, of course, it's, we could reuse the language It's the hey guys, say, how you doing, right? Guys proximity. and girls, we guys say hey guys. And guys right? and, you know, but, oh, you should say... Say hey guys, it's a group. Growing up and going through English, I remember that you know he was used as a dominant form when describing anything, whether it was girl, a guy, or a girl, right? Um, so, I, I hope, I hope that you know we can turn into a society that eases back on some of these things, especially right. as a real estate society, and we say let's apply common logic to some of these things. Can we ease back on some of these language restrictions when we're just trying to write a pretty description to say like my seller's house is close yeah. to the beach? You know, like we, we and a lot of the public doesn't realize the things that we can't say, the things that we can't do. How come you didn't put this? How come you didn't say that? Well, because I actually can't. So we have to have that discussion with them too. Or what our limitations are and how we're describing a property. Right. It's so, so that crazy. that that's the kind of stuff, and I think it applies and to 
if you've had a deal fall apart lately because we got a buyer that was the best and the highest, but the deal didn't go through, that's a result of us not being able to look any further than the surface because a risk of possibly breaching liability and and that person's, like, uh, you know, privacy, Right. right? So it's so frustrating for us as the agents, too, and I hope the consumers out there understand it, and I hope the new agents understand that, like, people that are on the cusp of possibly being the future brokers of tomorrow Kyle and people like Kyle, they lobby up at the state level and they get involved in all these different organizations because you can't make impact on these issues without being where Kyle is on the ground level. So, Well, the two things that I always say. Number one, you're not the future of this business. You're the now of this business. Yeah, you're in this business. So anybody that's telling you, oh, you're the future of the business, future brokers, yes. Yeah. Future broker owners, yes. But yeah. you're... Anyone that says, oh, you're the future of the business. No, you're the now of the business, and you can make an impact now. Two, agents, brokers, family ask me all the time, why are you so involved on a volunteer level? Why do you go... My wife says, I don't see other realtors having to go up to Albany or going down to D.C. or I don't see other... Yeah, and other realtors aren't as successful as I am. They're not as involved as I am. They're not as passionate as I am about it. And my standpoint on it is... If I don't have a seat at the table, I'm on the menu. And I don't want to be the agent in the office bitching and moaning about a rule that had come down or something that had passed without knowledge of what the conversation was. I want to be in that conversation. I want to be making that decision for our industry because I'm the now of this industry, right. not the future of it. Right. Right. And that decision is going to affect my brokerage, going to affect my income, going to affect my livelihood, right. I want to be there to make the decision. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Valid point. So, yeah. uh, I don't know if you were trying to push there for, uh, you know, invest or you know, get involved, but absolutely, like, this This is how absolutely. I, I, I mean, get listen, involved and get surrounded by other like-minded people. The two of us took, took similar but slightly different paths in getting to where we are now. Um, you know, the the political version of what we do has its place, it has its necessity, it's got, I mean, they need people to get involved. The and core then, value of the organization is advocacy. Yeah. It's advocacy for home ownership, right. for homeowners' rights, and to protect our industry. Yeah. That's the core value of the association. Yeah. Be part of that. Yeah. Especially if you want to have a job in the future. Yeah. We're not doing it for us. We have our job. <laughs> right. We'll we have a job. We'll be I don't want to be here takes... 10 years from now. I've got a plan to get out. <laughs> this, this, this all, you know, this all depends on you guys, uh, yeah. you know, take, taking, the, taking the wheel over from there. And I, it's, that is the way I see it, you know, and that when I got back into the business after a while, it, it became really clear to me, like, you got an understanding of this business and you have the ability to do it. And people gravitate to you and you for that information. And um, we found our place. Yeah, for sure. I love where I am, and let's do another one of these and talk about how we get out of this, and <laughs> <laughs> or how I do. And you continue with, uh, continue that torch, right? That sounds good. Cool. That sounds Th- good. Thanks for the use of your space. Hey, listen, <laughs> I appreciate abs- it. Absolutely, we'll get my studio up and running. Together. Bar's always really open, good. as we know. Yeah. Um, we'll be putting together uh, some of the real estate agents and golf carts drinking Bloody Marys again, and uh, get you out there swinging the golf clubs. Too. Sounds so, good. Fun. I'll embarrass myself on the course for everyone's pleasure. The, the, the editing, magic of editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's perfect. except for when I played against Dan O'Neill, I really. Did put up a good fight. I, the wheels just came off on the eighth. I believe it. I believe it. You know, what we should do. We should do. Uh, we should do two sums. We should do like a four. We'll do a four sum out there. Do, yeah. do two oh, verse two. I yeah. love it. That'd yeah. be fun. Cool. Cheers, brother. Cheers, man. Thank on you. the house. Follow Kyle. <laughs>